Hey, what's going on, U.S. history people? Video number seven for you today, the Articles of Confederation and Constitutional Compromises. So much info, so much good stuff. It's going to be a great video, so let's jump right in. The Articles of Confederation, we want you to think of one word when describing them, and that word is weak. So this is the first government of the newly independent United States. This is the government that was in effect during and after the American Revolution. It predates the Constitution. It was ratified by all 13 states in 1781. So really the end of the war is when it gets ratified and it helped maintain American independence. And it was a representation of American fear of a strong central government. Remember, we touched on this in the last video that there was such fear of King George III in a strong central government. When the founders created their first government, they decided to purposely design it very, very weak. So when you're studying the Articles of Confederation in the big context of American history, it really is important to understand it's a weak form of central government. But before we focus on the weak T, which is the Articles of Confederation, we do have to know that it does come out with some strengths. There are some things that, you know, that we took from the Articles before the new Constitution was actually created. So some things that we can consider strengths or some positives of the Articles. First of all, it was the actual first form of independent government for the United States. So it helped to negotiate the end of the American Revolution and really gained our independence. So that's one important thing. Also, it developed the borders between Canada, the Mississippi River, and Florida. So it really started to outline what the boundaries of the, the early United States was going to be. One of the probably the most important or significant positives of the Articles is what, how it really sets up a program in order to bring in new states into the Union. So the Land Ordinance of 1785, as well as the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, and you might want to star these because these are important, they developed the program to admit new states into the Union and also it will prevent the spread of slavery into the Northwest Territory. So one thing we did talk about in a previous video is that with independence, we see some factions within American society starting to talk about limiting the spread of slavery. So Ohio is located in the Northwest Territory pictured here, and that state never had slavery because slavery was banned from the Northwest Land Ordinance of 1787. Absolutely know that. Be able to explain it. You'll see it on the test, I guarantee you. Okay, so let's jump over to the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. There's going to be quite a few. The federal government could not directly tax citizens. They could ask states and citizens to pay taxes, but they had no enforcement of it. So Mr. Lawrence, if you were not compelled to pay taxes and the government asked you to pay taxes, would you voluntarily just hand money over? Uh, probably not. Yeah, that's what most Americans were thinking too. So the federal government could really only get revenue from selling land in the Northwest Territory. There also was no national currency. So we think of the dollar bill today, that is a dollar bill in all 50 states and territories. Back then, each state had its own currency and those currencies fluctuated. They weren't the same, so it made trading very difficult. There was no central executive to make decisions in times of crisis. There was basically a legislative branch and that was pretty much it. There's no national judiciary to resolve disputes between states. So if New York and New Jersey had an issue with each other, they wanted to go to a court system, guess what? Didn't exist. No national army and this is going to come back to cause problems in America's early infancy and the federal government could not regulate the economy in any way, shape, or form. And one of the major problems was there was a lot of debt from the American Revolution. Wars are expensive, and a lot of states were in debt. So even though we saw some strengths with the articles, definitely a lot of weaknesses. And as time goes on under this new form of government, many people start to question its legitimacy. One big thing that will kind of shake the confidence of the Articles of Confederation, the new American government, is Shays' Rebellion. And what this was, so this was a rebellion that took place in Massachusetts, and really it showed that the government couldn't respond properly in a time of crisis. So this really made people question, is the Articles, is the new American government going to last? So as a result, we start to see delegates coming together to really start talking about what could be done to reshape the Articles of, of Confederation make it more effective as a form of government. And who is this guy standing right here who's elected president of the Constitutional Convention? Hmm. Very famous president of uh, the Constitutional Convention. I'm going to say George Washington. You got it. Look at you. So this Constitutional Convention took place in Philadelphia in 1787. And again, they were looking to really change up the articles, realize it's not going to happen. So they're pretty much going to have to chuck the articles and start from scratch and create a new form of government for the United States. 
The goal, again, was to amend, but they weren't able to. So what we're going to see is the election of George Washington as the president of the convention. Mr. Soros, why do you think it was so important that Washington was elected president of the convention? Well, he was a revered war hero from the Revolutionary War, and he was from Virginia in the South. So he helped bring southern states to the convention. And he, he brings a lot of legitimacy and kind of... Because he was such a popular guy, if he supported this, there's probably a good amount of Americans who are going to support this new government as well. And we had guys like Franklin and Hamilton who supported our stronger national government. Um, we did see factions start to develop, but not all Americans did support this. Again, the reason why we fought a revolution against the British is because we were fearful of having too strong of a government overseeing American lives. So you had people like Patrick Henry who did not attend and were against the development of a strong central government. Two very important founders, Jefferson and Adams, were overseas serving as diplomats in Europe. So they were not at the Constitutional Convention at the time. Many groups, as we know, were not represented. As we talked about in earlier colonial times, it was really land-owning wealthier white men who were part of the political process. This continued into early American independence as well. And finally, it became clear that the articles would need to be completely replaced. Okay, so some convention compromises, you need to know all of them. And a compromise is when two sides get together and agree upon an issue. So the first one is going to focus on the debate over congressional representation. We're looking at Congress here, the Capitol building, and how would states be represented in Congress? So Virginia has a plan led by James Madison, and he proposed that representation is based on population. Now, this would favor large states because the more people a state has, the more representation they would have. Small states would be against this, and New Jersey introduced a plan in which representation would be based on a set number of delegates. In other words, equal representation per state. This was supported by smaller states because they were afraid they would be outnumbered by the states with larger population. Two sides come together in what's known as the Connecticut Compromise, or what you'll most likely see it as the Great Compromise. This created a bicameral legislature. Circle bicameral for us, please. This is a two house legislature or two houses of Congress. How many houses? Two, just like a bicycle, bicameral bicycle. The House of Representatives is based on population, so larger states have more representatives than smaller states. And the Senate is a set number of senators or equal number of senators per state at two. All right, so continuing our study of the Constitutional Convention and the compromises that come from it, we do have to know what was known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. And again, the issue of slavery comes up. Um, as we talked about, this institution continues to follow us through American history. And Southern representatives wanted to count enslaved peoples towards the congressional representation. Now, the more people, as we said, within the House of Representatives one state has, gives them more voting power, and gives them more power and say within the legislative branch. Northerners, on the other hand, who were as not as supportive of the issue of slavery, fear that counting slaves would give the South an unfair congressional advantage. So ultimately, this compromise allows three-fifths of enslaved peoples to count towards representation in the House of Representatives. As a result of this, we also see the Slave Trade Compromise, which stated that slavery would remain legal under the new Constitution, but the importation of slaves would end after 20 years following its ratification. So again, slavery does not come to an end as an institution, but slave importation was supposed to come to an end. And finally, the Electoral College, something that we see is referred to kind of as indirect representation. We know this today when we study American government, even currently, that when you vote for them, you're not directly voting for that specific candidate. It's through something known as the Electoral College, where we have an indirect election of the executive who would serve a four-year term. All right, let's do a quick recap. We have the articles of Confederation were very weak, but there were some positives, including the Northwest Land Ordinance. Shays' Rebellion was a rebellion led by Revolutionary War veteran Daniel Shays and made up of farmers to protest economic conditions under the Articles of Confederation. The Virginia plan was based on population, whereas the New Jersey plan for representation was proposed equal representation per state. They hammered out a compromise known as the Great Compromise. The Three-Fifths Compromise counted three out of five or 60% of slaves towards population in the House. And the Slave Trade Compromise would allow this international slave trade to end, which it did in the year 1808. Please circle 1808. It's a very important year to know. All right, guys, look forward to seeing you back here for video number eight, the Constitution and Ratification. Thank you for watching and have a good day.